The University of Texas at El Paso is a campus that is over 100 years old. Throughout those years, the Student Alumni Association has been the key holder of UTEP's history. And this season, some of UTEP's chilling stories will be released. In this year's edition of SAA's Haunted Campus, you will be teleported to another era. Seemingly familiar locations across the university will have their stories come to light. So widen your eyes and open your ears. A podcast is how you will experience this creepy new year. Our first stop will be at the Union Dinner Theater. The building's foundation was built in 1948 and originally called the Student Union Building. It had just one floor and had previously housed a bowling alley and a barber shop. For a period of time, it was even home to the Union Ballroom. In 1987, the building became what is now known as the UTEP Dinner Theater and has long been an edifice of student activities in the heart of the main campus. Now that we've arrived, I will pass on this tale to our storyteller. This is one of the five performing stages on campus and is also the site where one of the youngest ghosts of UTEP still haunts today. According to Mr. Glenn Brooks, a technical director of the Southwest Repertory Organization, there is the ghost of a little shirtless boy in the playhouse. In a story by the El Paso Times, Mr. Brooks is quoted as saying that nearly half a dozen people have seen this ghostly figure. Mr. Brooks describes the ghost as Little wrestling boy in short pants, no shirt, he's mischievous. During bad habits in 1979, I saw him in silhouette picking the light up, up on the catwalk. Some say that the boy was somehow buried alive during the building's construction, or he just simply wandered in. Either way, the little boy is just one of the many ghostly inhabitants of the university. We will now move on from the dinner theater to our next stop, and hopefully we don't see the little boy on our way out. We have arrived at the psychology building, stop number two. What is now known as the psychology building was originally built in 1949 as a biological science building and housed the labs and classrooms of both the chemistry and biology departments. In 1976, the building finally was claimed home by the psychology department after the two other departments both outgrew the building's facilities and relocated to new headquarters on campus. The psychology building is one building that has been home to many strange goings on over the years, to include being home to animal research during the 1950s and 60s, including monkeys and other small lab animals and other types of experimentation conducted on students, volunteers, that today would seem like they were scenes out of a sci-fi movie. Though there are no specific spirit hauntings, this building aside from the whispers of grad students praying for their grades, or the occasional dark shadow figure that has been seen lurking around the end of the hall and stairway of the west end of the building, on the third floor. In speaking to some of the office staff recently, it was related that several graduate students who have access to the building have reported noises emanating from this same west end of the building. So too have they related seeing this mysterious specter that seems to frequent the dim stairs. Whatever or whomever is the cause of these experiences, all seem to agree that it is friendly at the least, not bothering anyone directly, but just letting their presence be known to the living. There's one former haunt that once occurred in this seemingly quiet building, a haunted artifact, more specifically, a dead radio. Janitors and even a few grad students working on research projects late into the night have reported hearing the radio come on at various times after 7pm. When the halls were silent and all the students and faculty had left for the day, it is said that the faint sound from the radio is heard quietly echoing down the halls as if someone were twisting the dial through the channel. In search of a long over radio program, or even, maybe, a missed miner's game. 
A member of janitorial staff tells their tale about one, encou one encounter they had that night. It was my first day to clean the, the psychology building. The night sky had covered the campus. I heard a noise that sounded like an old radio changing channels. At first, I thought professors or grad students was working here late. I remembered that no one was here that day. The next day, I heard the same thing. This time, I followed the noise to one of the classrooms and found the radio. I checked to see if the radio was on but noticed one thing. The radio was broken and didn't have any of the inside parts for it to work. Does a ghost of a former professor or maybe a janitor still de dedicated to the care of the building who loved music haunt the radio? Or maybe the radio is an error leak? We may never know the true story about this haunted artifact. Today, no one knows the whereabouts of the mysterious radio. Is it in a professor's office? Perhaps one of the basement storage rooms? Or maybe it has been long discarded in one of the department's purges. What is known is that when nights are quiet and the building is thought to be all but empty, the sound of music or even an old football game can still be heard emanating from somewhere within the building. I hope you enjoyed the stories of the psychology building. Now, we will shuffle out and make our way to Old Main. On the top of the hill, flanked by palm trees, is Old Main. Please, watch your step as we climb the stairs leading to the building. We wouldn't want another accident. Something to keep in mind is that the building was constructed in 1917 and was originally the administration building. It has also served in many other capacities over the years, to include at one time holding the campus snack bar, served as a library until 1920, being home to the campus bookshop, and for a period of time housed a small museum while the Centennial Museum was under construction in the late 1930s. The old structure is now occupied by the Sociology and Anthropology Department. And like the halls of many other buildings on campus, these halls too play host in strange activities when the lights go out and the doors are locked. But the storyteller can tell you more about that. In 2002, five students from the Prospector, the UTEP newspaper, spent the night in the building to investigate old rumors of ghosts that are still set to haunt the oldest building on the main campus. What was reported still gives many chills when they hear the tale, or even just by reading the reports. According to the report from five investigators, they heard footsteps walking down the corridors above them and even going up and down the stairs of the only stairway inside the building. It's the stairway behind me, and if you'd like, I'd love to show you around the second floor where they also reported doors opening and closing on their own and the lights too going on and off without the aid of human fingers. And even the sound of a lecture being given in one of the classrooms to a class by a professor who wasn't there. To a class that didn't occupy the seats which were discovered to be empty upon investigation. One student reporter further recants the noises they had all encountered while the group was all huddled together, as well as the sounds of frenetic intent of someone rattling on the two French doors, then going to investigate and not finding a single soul. Still makes some of the newspaper staff think twice before considering visiting the building again after dark. Why do these things continue to happen? And are they the ghosts of many of the students from the past reliving their college days? Or are they maybe spirits from beyond trying to warn us of something? No one will ever really know. 
but it does set the tone for potential investigations one day. As you leave the building, please again, keep in mind the steps as you walk over to Quinn Hall. It is sometimes rather difficult to see where your feet are stepping at night. We have safely arrived at Quinn Hall, our fourth stop of the night. Quinn Hall, also known as the Old Geology Building, later renamed in 1981 in honor of geology professor Howard Quinn, is a unique building and is located further up the hill. Though you will hear many stories and lore of students and staff haunting these campus buildings, Quinn Hall is the only to report a case of a dead professor. Legend has it that when Quinn Hall was home to the English department, a professor who had just gotten the unsettling news of his wife's affair had took his life by hanging himself from the ceiling of his vacant second floor classroom. It is said that late at night, footsteps can be heard leading to the old classroom. Even today, some have said that they have seen the shadow of the dead scholar still haunting the area. We will now make our way towards the Rubin Center. One of the oldest buildings at the university is the Rubin Center, also known as Seaman Hall. Built in 1927 and named after UTEP geology and mining professor William Henry Seaman, this structure has served many different roles in the years past, and as you can imagine, there are several eerie tales that come with the dust and the cobwebs. According to campus police, this is a most active building on campus, and they frequently respond to the mysterious and unexplained calls at night. The most noted story is that of a geology student and the tragic laboratory accident that occurred when the building was home to the geology department. Allegedly, this young man was conducting an experiment and accidentally mixed two wrong chemicals. The beaker he was using exploded, burning his face and creating a great deal of noxious fumes that quickly filled the room. Tragically, the gases were too poisonous to risk anyone entering the room to rescue the downed student. Sadly, he died in the room before the fire department could arrive and save him. Today it is said that one can see the face of this tragic victim looking out windows as people walk by. Back in the 1930s and 40s, one of the deans used to invite some of his favorite students to private tea parties he would host after hours here in the hall. As one might suspect, activities other than scholarly talks developed between some of the students in attendance, despite a great deal of university supervision to prevent any problems from happening. A relationship blossomed between one of the gentleman students and one of the young ladies at the tea parties. However, their relationship quickly turned sour and rumors began to swim around in the community that the girl was pregnant. Soon after, the girl was found murdered and attention soon turned to her lover, who was thought to have killed her. Today, witnesses over the years have all told similar stories of an old-style car driving slowly up to the Rubin Center at around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and the ghost of a beautiful woman dressed in 1930s-style clothes gets out of the car and enters the building. Others have reported seeing the same young woman wandering around the deserted building, searching for someone or something that seems to no longer be found. The last tragic tale involves an unlucky janitor who is said to still take care of the building to this day. One of the most recent experiences was uncovered while one of the haunted tour coordinators was doing some research into the ghosts of the Rubin Center. While talking to one of the senior staff members, he was told of an incident that was actually caught on video by the then new security system. According to the report from the staff member, before the new system was updated to include motion detectors and video cameras, the staff would frequently come in and find art on the floors or hangings tilted on the walls. Initially, the museum staff blamed the custodial staff for being careless while cleaning the museum after hours. That is, until one incident 
after the new upgrades to the system came online. One morning in 2006, during the showing of the Multiplicity exhibition, a staff member came in to open up for the day and discovered a couple of pieces from one of the hanging exhibits were laying on the floor, and one in particular was broken in pieces. This particular exhibit was suspended from the ceiling and was in the middle of the room at the time. When this was reported, the director of the museum was furious at whom was again assumed to be a careless janitor. The director contacted campus police and requested to review the video footage of the night in question, determined to discover who had been disturbing the exhibits. Upon meeting at the police station to review the tapes of that night, the police officer related to the director that, according to the access logs, no one had gone in that night at all. Then, upon reviewing the video of what had happened, in the still shot video they all saw the three pieces that had been hung and secured with high grade piano type wire fall to the floor, also showing the one shattered piece break. The footage showed nobody, nor anything near the art piece, nor anything to touch it. It just seemingly fell to the floor without any human touch at all. To this day, there has not been any real explanation why that particular exhibit was damaged the way it was, nor have they been able to explain why paintings hung on the walls often are still found askew. We will now proceed to the next location. Please watch for skunks and cats that roam the area. You might need to catch your breath after that long story. We'll be back in a few. Don't get lost. Or do. We'll add it to our collection of stories. The UTEP Haunted Campus 2020 Tours is brought to you by the UTEP Student Alumni Association, also known as SAA. As members of this amazing organization, we are the keepers of tradition. Our main goal is to maintain existing minor traditions, while at the same time creating new ones that will capture the UTEP morale to keep minors driven. We do our best to strive to act as one continuous link between current UTEP students and UTEP alumni to aid in the cultivation of the minor nation. Visit UTEPMindTracker.com to learn more about SAA and what we have planned for the semester. You can also fill out our interest form at UTEP-SAA.QuestionPro.com or follow us on our social media accounts. Our Instagram handle is at UTEP underscore SAA and our Facebook is at UTEP.SAA. Our Haunted Campus tours wouldn't be a success without listeners like you. Thank you. Well, I see you've made it back. Congratulations. Glad you didn't get lost in the mines. Welcome to the all-glorious, phenomenal Fox Fine Arts. This building was built in 1974, named in 1978 after Josephine Clarity Fox, local art enthusiast and UTEP supporter. The Fox Fine Arts Center has played host to numerous stage performances, concerts, and even class lectures for nearly 40 years. This complex also plays host to a few no longer living members of the community as well. Specifically, a ghost who is said to haunt the recital hall. According to the legends, the recital hall ghost haunts the upper balcony, sitting quietly on the right side motionless watching the rehearsals below. It is rumored that this ghost belongs to an unknown soul who fell to their death many years ago from that very balcony. No one really knows yet what exactly happened, but one thing is true. Whomever the spectator may be, to this day, this mysterious figure is seen observing the activities of the living. Another ghost is said to also haunt the fine arts complex, known to many dance and theater majors roaming an area in the bowels of the fox, particularly in the costume department, known as the Lavender Lady. 
This ghost seems to be friendly and manifests herself in the way of the scent of lavender and occasionally her shadow is seen passing through the dressing rooms during rehearsal and even during performance nights. A likely identity of our lavender lady may be that of the building's namesake, Josephine Clardy Fox herself. Mrs. Fox was an only child and having no children of her own, left her entire estate to the futures of young people. Mrs. Fox left roughly three million to UTEP, more than 1,000 rare and valuable books to the El Paso Library, as well as the donation of hundreds of her wonderful hats at the time of her death in 1970. With her love for life and others, Mrs. Fox may still be lingering the halls of the Fine Arts Center that is her legacy. The signature of lavender perfume wafting in the air, signaling her presence to the living benefactors of her endowment to the university. I hope you enjoyed the show. Break a leg on your way to McGoffin Auditorium. We are now at McGoffin Auditorium, our seventh stop of the night. The university has a total of five performance stages. The McGoffin Auditorium is one of the largest and is home to a few cast of haunted occurrences, led by the ghost who goes by the name of Jose. In his living life, Jose was a stagehand who fell to his death from one of the catwalks above the stage. Now, in his ghostly life, Jose is known to continue to wander about the catwalks above the stage and also chase dancers throughout the basement. Other encounters reported by visitors have been the sightings of shadow people in the control booth above the audience, noises coming from the spaces above, odd lights in the dark, and even phantom shadows of people in the back rows and in the corners of the seating areas. This is also one of the most paranormally active areas. Recently, on a walkthrough of the proposed route, many of the guides and tour team members, some of whom are also members of the El Paso del Norte Paranormal Society, encountered a great deal of activity just in the lobby and on parts of the stage. The tour coordinator and two other team members had even heard what sounded like the front door is being rattled as if someone was trying to get in. Upon investigation, thinking it was another team member who was intending to meet up with everyone at the McGoffin, the trio found the front doors were closed and secured. And upon stepping outside to check, no one was found anywhere near the doors. The late team member showed up roughly 10 minutes later and when she was asked if she saw anyone, she reported not seeing anything other than the cats. She was then told the story, and she quickly became very nervous. A great deal of activity was also detected by monetary devices that some of the team members had with them in the lobby men's room. And what was intended to be a simple walk through the proposed route, quickly became a short paranormal session that has since prompted the request for an official paranormal investigation of the building. One explanation for the large amount of ghostly activity in this particular building is tied to a theater tradition that dates back to the times of William Shakespeare, the keeping of a ghost light on the stage. Tradition states that every stage must have a ghost light lit when the theater closes for the night and when there isn't any kind of setup on the stage in order to honor the spirits of those players and performers who have gone on before us and so that they have a light to continue to perform by. McGoffin is the only stage in the university to not have a ghost light to this day, but frequently leaves the stage and lobby lights on for safety purposes and nights. 
Now let's move along the sidewalk to our next stop, Cotton Memorial. Thank you for making your way to our next stop of the tour. We hope you've enjoyed the tour thus far. Cotton Memorial was constructed back in 1947 and has been home to the University Communications Department and KTEP FM Radio. Since then, many faculty, staff, and students have reported strange occurrences over the years. Much of these reports can be found in UTEP's campus newspaper, as Cotter Memorial makes a list for being one of the most haunted buildings on campus. Behind me, looming above us, are five windows which overlook the front door to Cotter Memorial. These are the windows to room 300 a conference room-sized classroom where in the 1990s, a former professor who worked in the building reported a recurring encounter with an apparition she described as a short man sitting at the conference table. She did a double take to make sure she was seeing what she saw, but the man at the table would be gone and the chair in which he was sitting was empty. In some other instances, some have reported seeing a man standing at one of the windows to room 300, looking out. When anyone inquired about who was in room 300, the answer was always the same. Nobody should be in there. There is only one way up to room 300, and that is via a narrow hallway at the top of a narrow staircase. When witnesses would look again, the man had disappeared. Some students have claimed feeling piercing eyes as if someone is watching them from above through the window. Who knows? If you look closely at the windows, you may just see someone standing by the window. Some students in the past have reported hearing footsteps coming from the floor above late at night in Connor Memorial while nobody else was inside the building. Another story claims of a female student who was in the building working by herself on a Sunday afternoon. She was alone in the building working in the radio station studios at the time when she had heard the staff entrance doorbell ring. This doorbell was known only to station staff members who worked on the weekends and the doorbell was hidden from obvious sight. As was normal on most weekends and after hours, the doors to the building were locked and the only way for anyone to gain access to the building was to ring the doorbell so that the on-duty staff member could let you in from the inside. As the doorbell continued to ring, the girl got up and went to see who was at the door. Upon her opening the door leading to the outside, she found a group of her friends who were trying to visit her on her shift. The student reportedly stated, Well, I see you found the doorbell, to which her friends frustratingly replied, What doorbell? You've been out here banging on the door for the past 45 minutes. So you may be asking yourselves, who was ringing the doorbell? Many students, faculty, and staff members have all reported seeing shadows and silhouettes of ghostly figures in various parts of the building. And in some cases, others have even heard screams in the night coming from parts of the empty halls and rooms. <laughs> One explanation offered for at least two of the ghosts comes from history. One is that of a supposed fatal accident involving a man working in the auditorium that once occupied Carter Memorial in its original construction. The man is said to have fallen to his death while working on some lights. Little do people know that Utah has a curse that claims people get hurt while working on stage lights which could explain what happened. After the fatal accident, the auditorium was built over and turned into a television studio and other spaces in the late 1970s for the Mass Communications Department. To this day, you can distinguish what used to be the auditorium by looking at the ceilings from the classrooms on the first floor of the building. Could we say that Cotton Memorial is haunted by those who worked diligently within the building and are haunting the halls of Cotton Memorial? Or is it just all our minds playing tricks? We may never know, that is, until we find ourselves toiling away late into the night of Cotton Memorial and get a visit from guests from beyond the grave. Thank 
you all for taking the time to listen in on the scary stories of Cotton Memorial. We will now make our way to UTEP's Centennial Museum. Welcome to the Centennial Museum. The Centennial Museum was built in 1936 with funds from the Texas Centennial Commission to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Republic of Texas and was completed on October 22nd of that same year. At the time, this was the first building on the university campus that was not built as a rectangle, but was instead built in a U-shape, featuring two stone urns resembling Boudinese prayer wheels, which crowned the front steps at the main entrance. In the early days of the museum, the basement was not only set up as a work and storage area for the building, but also housed a small dormitory for students attending the then Texas College of Mines. In exchange for their board, residents had to work as guards and janitors for the buildings. The building is now 77 years old and is still very much in operation and is open to the public. Many people visit the Centennial Museum during the day, but after five o'clock when the doors are closed, the volunteers and staff claim to have experienced a few unexpected guests lingering around. Long after, the living guests have gone. Throughout the night, many of the staff have reported encountering what has been described as a young girl, whom the staff have come to call her by the name Isabel. Young Isabel has been known to have a great deal of fun with staff members and the occasional guest or janitor by chasing them up the main staircase, laughing and giggling as she enjoys the company of her living playmates. Among some of her other tricks, Elizabeth likes to play is that of calling the elevators to the different floors. Just like many elevators that have been sent to a floor to pick up its passengers, a bell rings as the car reaches its destination. But the difference between the elevators being summoned by the living as opposed to the dead, when Isabel calls for a ride, the doors do not open. Some of the volunteers and staff of the Centennial Museum say that little Isabel isn't the only spectral friend haunting the exhibits and pieces of the museum. It is said that lurking around the upper floor is the dark shadow of a man, frequently seen by the stairs. No one knows the name of this man, but he is known to quietly say, Good afternoon, or when is that is, and also, thank you, or Yes, yes. to staff and guests alike as they pass by. Some of the staff believes that these two ghostly volunteers are connected to the artifacts that are kept in the bowels of the building or possibly the building itself. We will now move on to the final stop of the night, Campbell Building. Most of the stories we've encountered this evening have come from the haunted happenings on the main campus. For this stop, we'll visit one of the two satellite campuses here in El Paso, the Campbell Building. The Campbell Building was built in the 1970s and was originally part of the now demolished Hotel Du Hospital. In fact, the tunnel that connects the two buildings is said to still exist to this day. Presently, the Campbell Building is being used as one of the two primary facilities of the College of Pharmacy to include being home to the catheter lab, which is located in the former hospital morgue in the building's basement. And this is where we will find one of the most chilling tells from the staff. One late night, just a few years ago, one of the contract custodial workers was in the building alone, cleaning in the basement just outside the cadaver lab. The custodian stated that the whole floor was quiet, which wasn't anything out of the ordinary and was actually quite routine. What wasn't routine was when she suddenly felt an icy hand grab her arm and pull. Terrified, the custodian ran to the stairwell door and began to run up to the ground floor where the campus public safety desk was located. As she ran through the door and up the stairs, she said that whatever it was chased after her and slammed the door open as it began to close behind her. The custodian made it safely upstairs and told the public safety officer on duty what had happened. The officer called for backup from the on-duty campus police and the floor was cleared. 
with nothing to be found. The custodian still works here at UTEP, but will not even go near the Campbell Building, not even the Campbell Building parking lot, and works elsewhere on campus in fear of what may be lurking in the basement. Thank you for joining us for the 13th annual Haunted Campus Tours. We hope that after this frightful year called 2020, we'll be able to see you all in person in 2021. We'd like to give a big thanks to the individuals who made this podcast possible. Our storytellers, Miriam Aguirre, Sitlali Aguirre, Liliana Cruz, Bruce Jordan, and Angel Roquillo. Our tour guide was Stacy Hume. And SA's advisor is Melissa Rivas. If you're interested in joining the Student Alumni Association, visit our profile on UTEP Mind Tracker or fill out our interest form at utep saaquestionproscom You can also follow us on our social media. Our Instagram handle is at utep underscore SAA and our Facebook is at utep.saa. Remember, we are students today alumni tomorrow, and minors forever. This was the 13th edition of Haunted Campus Tours, brought to you by the Student Alumni Association at the University of Texas at El Paso. Haunted Campus is SA's largest fundraiser. Through your donations, we are able to support our organization and offer more great events like this one. If you'd like to donate, check out the description box of this podcast for more information. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Stay safe and go Miners!